Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Hold on. You're on. You're on. Crew, often absent during key time. Rudy Crew. Rudy Crew, the education czar, if you will, in the state of Oregon. Well, there's been, there's been a great deal about uh, the education system here in the state of Oregon. And hey, we're going to have quite a discussion today. And as usual, you choose education form. I mean, I'm, I'm so excited about the fact that uh, we have joined forces with uh, the You Choose group. And we just happen to have one of their principal person with us, and they're talking about Chana Cox, and, and she's going to be with us, and we've got a guest, we're going to go on, and uh, I'm going to give her the opportunity to introduce our guest. And I'm just going to read a couple of things here that um, uh, we're going to be pro pretty well focusing on, but, but I guess the headline is it, from, a, from, a, from Oregon standpoint, from you choose stand, uh, from the education form will be, will Governor Kitzhopper's plan to improve education in Oregon actually work? That's the question mark. That's the discussion. And here are some of the areas that we'll probably be covering during this discussion. Will the new Common Core standards make education in Oregon better? Will Rudy Cruz's resignation significantly impair the governor's plans? Can educational excellence be achieved by regulations from Salem? And I, I tell you, there's all sorts of things. I mean, when you start thinking about education in the state of Oregon, in fact, education around the country for that matter, people are so confused. We're going to try to keep it such that you can understand where we're coming from. And that's why I, I'm, I'm so excited about the fact that you choose. We're able to go in there and get the facts, get the background. And so we're going to get a discussion. But at the same time, when we talk about this whole idea of where we're going from here, we're going to talk about where we've been, where we're going, and, uh, and also maybe talk about some solutions to the problem. That's the key. Too often you have discussions, but there are no solutions. And it's very, very important for our futures that we, in fact, we educate our society, especially our young folks. We're getting at that point in life, like myself, I'd like to pass that baton, but whether or not I'm going to be able to retire successfully, that, that is a question mark that I have and I'm very concerned about, okay? So with that, I'm going to have Chan and I just come on in and kind of maybe just do a little brief on You Choose Ben, let them know what, okay. what we're talking about and why. You Choose Education Forum, yes. you know, uh, is devoted to uh, educating people on uh, basically political and economic and educational issues uh, from the perspective of limited constitutional government and individual responsibility and freedom. So. Uh, we have from time to time appeared or, uh, as guests on your show, but it, over the last three or four months we've started doing a monthly show with you. And this month, it's uh, last month I understand it was on immigration. It was a very good show. The month show. before on Measure 11, this yes. month we're taking on the Kitzhaber plan. Yes, I like it. Uh, and uh, I would like to introduce our expert speaker yes. Don I mean I'm a I'm I'm a college professor in political theory but Don here has spent 35 years in the system he's got a doctorate he's taught at the college level but he has taught in the schools he's been a very important voice in the Baltimore curriculum experiments attempting to improve the Baltimore school systems which are probably as bad as the Oregon school system. And he came to Oregon, I believe, to be an administrator for what, Arthur Academy? Yes, for the Arthur Academy Charter School. The Charter School, okay. Yes. So Don has the nitty gritty knowledge yeah. of the facts and the history. Uh, whereas I kind of have the flyover at 30,000 feet knowledge. But it's good, dude. <laughs> Sometimes you need it. So <laughs> let, let's start with the flyover. Oregon schools rank, according to Education Week, either 41st or 43rd out of 50 in the nation. Hmm. And no state in the nation, not even the top state, Massachusetts, comes anywhere near meeting international standards. We went from the top of the heap in 1950 to the bottom of the heap in, in 2013. So Governor Kitzhaber wants to fix it. Um, and. Uh, his fixing it is basically based on a centralized plan from 
uh, Oregon with fixed goals and the goals are that by 2025 40 percent of Oregon kids will have four-year college degrees, 40 percent will have two-year college degrees, and 20 every Oregonian will graduate from high school. Well, that's the plan. That's the plan and it's a wonderful plan and it's a great goal but remember right now one-third of our kids drop out of high school certainly in the minor areas and only 38 percent of the graduates of any description are equipped to do the most minimal w work at a two-year college. Okay, Let's bring in Don here for a moment and Don why don't you make your little intro let's do your intro before we get into some of the points we're going to be asking you. Sure. Okay. So after uh, Spent about a year, a decade as a teacher, special education teacher, and then I went on to get a doctorate at the University of Oregon in special education and taught at the university level for a while uh, in Wisconsin and up in Western Washington. And then I got interested in uh, training teachers around the country and did that for a few years. And then uh, uh, as charters began to develop, I really felt like it was time to put my money where my mouth was, mm -hmm. as I say, let's get into some charter schools and see if we can really make a difference. And uh, so the first one I was able to get with was at Columbus, Ohio, in a 100% African American school, inner city uh, Columbus. I worked also with the uh, uh, National Institute for Direct Instruction and then in Baltimore with the Baltimore Curriculum Project, also 100% African American schools on the east side of Baltimore. And then uh, the opportunity came up to um, uh, run the charter schools, the Arthur Academy charter schools uh, here in Portland. And uh, so I've been all about effective instruction, effective education, training teachers, and and then how do you carry that out to a school level to make schools excellent and what does it take? And uh, there's a, a tremendous amount of details and follow through that you have to do to, to help things be effective and, and I've worked on all of those things and I'm just stunned at the governor's arrogance thinking that he can make schools better from Salem if if I was a governor I, I couldn't make them better from Salem you know you have to be in the school in the classrooms looking at the details of instruction and curriculum and all of that in order to make things better and that's you know you, you can't do that from the top down Bob tell me uh, Don uh, tell me um, as far as your earlier career in mm -hmm. the classroom, was that mm -hmm. here in the Oregon area? Actually, uh, Southern California. Southern California. I don't mention that too much when I'm okay, in Oregon. Right. Okay, you okay. Know, but you were in the classroom. Like, I was in the classroom okay. for, for many years. And in what area within the California? Uh, so, um, I was in Southern California. Southern California. So I worked in uh, Oxnard, uh, okay. which is a highly Mexican-American area. Um, I worked in um, Whittier, actually, the uh, old high school that uh, President Nixon went to, okay. and I think some of the desks were left over from his time, and um, <laughs> and also uh, on the tough side of Ventura, California. Okay. So um, uh, generally and largely minority areas, and um, and then with kids in uh, w with IEPs, special education students. Well, thank you for for serving, if you will, in that capacity. <laughs> because in all due respect, that's one of probably our major issues here within our country, for that matter, the concerns for the large dropout rates among minorities. And uh, so we welcome, and we're going to be welcoming you in regards mm -hmm. to the response and some of the things that we're going to be saying today. So as you note, uh, I did indicate that when we opened up that uh, the, the, the article that was in the Sunday Oregon in the Metro Northwest section, crew often absent during key times, and there was a focus, if you will, in terms of um, uh, his spendings, his whereabouts, and things of that nature. But there was a lot of, a lot of emphasis on, on uh, Mr. Crew. However, you know, is that the issue, and was that the issue? So we'll just get right into what we're talking about here today. Uh, let me ask you this particular question, both of you, for that, and just play on in there. What was Rudy Cruz's role in the plan, and will his leaving make a significant difference? Can I start off? Yeah. I don't think his leaving will make a significant difference because I think his role was to craft for the governor some sort of a master plan. Uh, and if you look at Rudy Cruz's history, that has been his role over the last, what, two decades. Mm -hmm. He doesn't stay any place long. Uh, and I don't know how long the governor hired him for, but I think that he crafted an extremely 
again, attractive and very ambitious plan. Uh, and I'll give the floor to Don. What Don, do you, what think? you think about that? Well, uh, same sort of thing. I think he, he uh, the, the, in these positions, they look for people who can be plausible, uh, be arrogant, and say, we're going to do this, and you're going to do that, and I know what's best for all of you, and this is an excellent plan, and wonderful things were going to happen, and not really have to worry about a person saying in the back of their head, can I really make this happen or not? No, you want those people who could just say, yep, we're going to do it. And um, so he was good at that, and he didn't need to be here all the time, just a few major speeches, and, and then he goes on and does the same thing somewhere else. Uh, it's it's very very difficult to change education and it takes a lot of little details and you can't do it from from that altitude but you can make great speeches and make good sounding things who do you think developed that particular plan do you think that Rudy did it? now they had a blue ribbon committee supposedly that um, that the kids Hopper put together right I have yeah. seen their blue ribbon committees mm -hmm. we've all seen government blue ribbon committees <laughs> They're coming out of our ears by now, Bruce. <laughs> but it is no, without question, Governor Kitzhaber set the parameters. Right, exactly. He signs off. He's, mm -hmm. he's, he's, he set the parameters. He said, we're going to have this 40-40-20. We're going to force it through. I think this is something like telling Detroit, and again, you know I'm from Detroit, yeah. that in 2025, every car produced in the United States is going to get 320 miles to the gallon. <laughs> That's the plan. Yes, <laughs> then he f hires somebody to say, oh, I know all these brilliant ways in which I'm going to get 320 miles to the gallon. Mm -hmm. And the guy gives out the plans and everybody is happy. Rudy Crew embroidered and filled in and came up with all kinds of what are now fairly standard notions of but achievement the, agreements. But still, at the end of the day, someone has to sign off on this. I mean, he just did, he's just not out there doing his own thing. I mean, no, 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 right? no, 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 no. The governor the has gov to sign it's off. It's the governor's it. plan. Yeah. Okay, okay. Rudy Crew okay. is simply the hired brain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Spokesperson, the hired if you will. spokesperson yeah. or authority, and he's got to be plausible. He's got to be intelligent. He's got to be convincing. He's got to inspire people. He did all of those things, and his job was done. Mm -hmm. You're speaking as if to say you were you had knowledge of the contract. Did you see the contract? No, but I know, <laughs> I know that this is there's nothing unusual here. Don, what do you think yeah. about that? Uh, I, I I just always amazed at this um, people that want to be um, judged on their intentions, you know, uh, and it, it's just breathtaking to me that the governor is going to tell people how many people are going to go to college like mm -hmm. no I, if I don't want to go to college you know I, I don't want to go to college you don't get to tell me you know and he could just as easily make up a plan to say by 2020 no one in Oregon will be overweight mm -hmm. you know he's got just about as much chance of that happening as 404020 uh, it, it, it isn't within it's not his decision to make you know, um, if we had more kids who were more successful all the way along in school, um, maybe more of them would choose to go to college, but maybe more of them would go to vote tech schools. Maybe more of them would uh, start businesses of their own. I don't know, and it's not the governor's business, and he can't make it happen. So it's, it, I'm always surprised that people just don't laugh at him, you mm -hmm. know, to say, to specify how many people are going to go to college and how many people are going to do this, how many people are going to do that. Um, it's not. It, luckily, I think we still have the choice. You know, we don't have to go to college if the, you don't. You know, right. but it's it's very yeah. clear that one of the ways in which everybody's going to go to college and graduate, and we can see that from the le legislative session, is that the colleges are going to have to accept all students mm -hmm. who apply. And, and that's a concern today. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so what days. happens is that the colleges more and more, and I know this is a, as somebody who taught at Lewis and Clark, and I know it from people who've taught at Reed, not mm -hmm. just, you know, the community colleges. The colleges more and more become schools for remedial education of people who are not prepared for college-level work. Mm -hmm. 
So yes, you can give everybody but a piece of paper at the end of four years, but if they're still only reading at the 11th grade level, and they have a piece of paper saying that they have an undergraduate degree, the degree is not worth much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to ask you another question before we get into these other things, thinking about the plan, if mm -hmm. you will. As you know, we went through, at one point in time, we had a state superintendent, and, and she was Ms. Castile, mm -hmm. right, Superintendent Castile. And when that transition happened, you, I would have thought that she would have been a part of that Blue Ribbon Committee yeah. just to pass the baton and asked her what her plan was before she was exited out of the, 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 the system. But we got none of that. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe that would, would have been critical, if you will, to kind of compare the notes, so to speak. Well, this, this is where we are at this point in time, but this is what we're going to do, et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't see the plan. Well, any, any, uh, any, any comments on They that? don't. You, we are now seeing the plan. In pieces, we are seeing the plan. Okay, okay. But th they don't want history. Because what is the history? A nation at risk, all the plans failed. Schools got worse. Uh, Vera Katz, a disaster. Again, I bought into a nation at risk. Now, former I, mayor of the city of Portland. But mm -hmm. also, she put in the Katz educational plan. Oh, right, that's right. That's and right. it was that's a disaster. Right. Mm -hmm. And its aspirations were wonderful. Uh, no Child Left Behind, a disaster. I mean, in the sense that the schools got worse, uh, and all the problems associated with the schools got worse. And, you know, I have to say that I agreed with, with No Child Left Behind. I agreed with Vera Katz. I, I agreed with The Nation at Risk. Um, I thought they should have worked. But I have a learning curve that didn't work. And so nobody wants to look at the history of the failures. They just want to advance a new plan. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what Don said. This is not as so much in our government. People are not going to be judged by their fruit. We are not going to know them by their fruit or their achievements. We're going to know them by their intentions. Did you like to add on, Don? Yeah, I just, uh, here's the thing about, you know, the idea of setting these standards, mm -hmm. right? If you think about it, it implies that there's some latent ability in there. There's, there's, it sounds like there's schools that are say, oh, Governor, oh, you want us to try hard? Oh, okay, well, we'll start trying hard now. We'll do better, you know. They're doing as well as they know how to do, right? It, it reminds me of, you know, Detroit. They were speaking of Detroit back in the 70s, you know. Uh, they didn't know how to make cars as good as the Japanese did. And they were making them as good as they could. Government edicts wouldn't have changed it. But Japanese cars came in, people started buying those, they started losing, and pretty soon they started thinking about new and different ways. But they had the freedom to try new and different things. We don't have freedom. We have less freedom now in education than we used to have. Uh, much less freedom than we had when I started in education 30 years ago. You have to do what's told. And so if you think this is a stupid idea, it doesn't matter. You have to do it. And so less freedom, less innovation, and a harder job. They don't know how to do better. We're not going to get something by the governor telling them they got to do better. Mm -hmm. We're going to get something by people trying new and different things. My personal belief is uh, it. what matters is uh, kindergarten and first grade. There's an 88% an um, chance if you do poorly in first grade, if you're in the bottom quartile in reading in first grade, that correlates to your achievement in 12th grade, 88%. Really? The, the problem is, is already set in those mm. first couple, three years when kids aren't taught how to read well. And you know, there's reading wars and there's um, big issues about phonics and how you teach reading and all of that. And I'm a strong proponent of very explicit instruction in reading. And we could get 100% of our kids reading. Um, and that doesn't happen very many we places. We used to. Well, oh, no, I, in, in our schools. Yeah. In, yes, in but, our but also our literacy rate at the beginning of the 20th century, when the schools were poor, the illiteracy rate was much higher than it is today in every community, including the minority community. Uh, the Catholic schools, they said, 
hundred percent of the kids are going to read, and they did read. Mm -hmm. We used to be able to do it. It's 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 these educational techniques that developed in the thirties, forties, fifties, and then metastasized in the sixties. What did comprehension leave out? Uh, let me let me just let me follow up on this one, and I'll come back okay, to sure, that. But sure. it's really critical to understand that if parents are given a choice. And, yours, and a school doesn't teach a kid to read in first mm -hmm. or second grade, parents are smart enough to know that, and they can take them over to some other school that does. And right away, our schools would improve because you're not going to make it as a school if you don't teach kids beginning reading. And once they can read and do some math facts and do some computation and all those other, a lot more can come after that. Um, but parents are way better at enforcing and the free market is way better at enforcing quality than the government is mm -hmm. part part of what government regulations do and people forget this but it applies everywhere when the government sets a regulation you're you're subject to that regulation you don't have to be good all you have to do is meet the government rules i did what the government told me right. so i'm okay right. in the free market doesn't matter what you do. If the guy down the street can do something better, you're going to lose exactly, market to exactly, that. Exactly. And so there's a constant competition to get better. Education hasn't gotten better in 50 years hmm. because there isn't any competition because there's only one system. So, And where there yeah. has been competition, where there have been charter mm -hmm. schools, the charter schools don't all do better, but many of them do. Certainly the uh, no excuses charter schools, we know mm -hmm. that now with a lot of data. but. The existence of charter schools in the district causes the public schools to do better because the public school administrators and teachers can say to the government and to the, to the union or to whatever, look, if we don't do better, we're going to lose, we're going to lose to these charter schools. Mm -hmm. But well, isn't but charter schools are also considered pu public schools? They too. are public they are. schools. Yeah, they're not a separate entity. But like so, I said, what is but the they difference? Have a bit of, so, yeah, what, what, what charter difference? schools have is some freedom okay. to do things differently. So, um, you don't have to, for instance, promote. Um, so, do social promotion if you choose not to. You can use a different curriculum than the district uses if the one that they're using isn't working, you can use something different, and that's what we did in our other academies. We used different kind of curriculum. Um, you can train teachers differently. You can set up different expectations. One of the wonderful things is that uh, you can set an expectation, for instance, that the kids do their work, mm -hmm. right, and put some consequences behind that until if you have parents who don't want to make their kids do their work and don't care about that, they take their kids elsewhere because you're too much trouble. Right, mm. and that's school choice. Is okay. This is a school for kids who are going to work hard and learn. Right, you can't do that in the public school. Right, you have to go to the lowest common denominator. You can't do any more discipline than the than the most permissive parent will allow, mm. because they're forced to be there. So you mm. can't have good discipline. Do you do you want to explain just because mm -hmm. some people might not know what social promotion is. Oh, social promotion is the idea that you have to go up a grade every year regardless of what you've mm -hmm. learned or haven't learned. And that's what we've been doing in this present system? Yes. Yes, yeah. I mean, very, very rarely. And there's, interestingly enough, there's research that shows that it doesn't do much good to hold kids back, but that's because we always hold kids back too late. So they go through a whole year, or say all of their second grade, they, they don't get anything because they should be in first grade. And then we retain them in second grade. Well, it doesn't do any good. They still, mm -hmm. and they need to be back in first grade material. And so um, if you put kids at a level where they have the skills necessary and then the teacher brings everybody up together, you can keep kids on track. Um, but you have to occasionally make exceptions. If somebody's not making it, they get another year to work on that. Uh, so freedom to do lots of different things. Um, and, of course, freedom to let teachers go if they're mm -hmm. not doing a good job. And um, that, uh, that those things in charter schools and give you the freedom to be better. So charter schools actually can let teachers go if they're not doing a good job? 
Absolutely. In all these certified. Yeah. Regular these certified public schools. Just, right. um, that depends the on the cur- state, doesn't the current, it? Yeah, the current law in Oregon says half of them have to be certified, half not um, in, the, in, the, in a given school. And what, a given what, what's the definition school. of the have nots in terms of? Oh, so they, they have a bachelor's degree okay. and um, they passed the tests okay. and they did okay. that, that sort of stuff, but they didn't, s- they t- didn't t- spend t- two years uh, sitting okay. in classes. Okay. Okay. And the, the test results since 1947 or 57 have indicated that while there's a tremendous range of, of talent uh, in teachers who have the college, uh, the master's degree, there is a tremen- and there's a tremendous range of talent of people who teach who don't have the master's degree. I'm not making this clear. Uh, there is no significant difference between the people on the whole who have the master's degree in teaching as teachers and the people who don't. So some of our best teachers now have come out of Teach for America. None of those kids have more than six weeks of teacher training. Mm -hmm. They have four-year college degrees from the best colleges in the country. They're very, they're very, Teach for America kids are really smart. They're very dedicated because they chose, you know, they could do lots of other things, but they chose to go work Mm -hmm. in the inner city. they need a supportive school, and so they go down in flames when when the structure isn't there. But if you give them enough help and structure, um, they can do amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, and what it shows is that two years of getting a teaching credential uh, doesn't make a difference. And and look, the KIPP academies were started by Teach for America kids. Michelle Ree, who was so effective in Washington D.C. before yeah. she and the mayor were voted out. She's a Teach for America. We that? have mm-hmm. whole cadres of Teach for America graduates who went in for two years of self-sacrifice and stayed in education mm-hmm. and have been making an enormous difference. <laughs> and although I'm a Republican, I have to admit that most of them are Democrats. <laughs> so, so they have Democrats for educational reform and they've done, by and large, a very good job. And not in the easy schools, because right. they're sent to the difficult schools. On the other hand, although Lewis, Lewis and Clark and, and local colleges produce as many Teach for America people as Teach for America will take, I think for every mm-hmm. 10 applicants they take two or something, mm-hmm. uh, Portland has not accepted any Teach for America teachers really? that I know of. Wow, that's huge. Hmm. Well, I tell you what. Let, let's go. I w- I'd like to get into another area here, and I'll, I'll, I'll go with you, Don, on this piece. How do Oregon schools rank nationally, internationally, in achievement? And at the same time, I'm going to throw in a little vocab stuff and mm-hmm. talk a little bit about that. Well, as I said, n- internationally, American schools are doing horribly, uh, and Oregon schools within the nation are doing very badly, if you just judge by achievement tests. Uh, on the other hand, Oregon schools went, I mean, you know, we're spending, we tend to spend less than other states now mm-hmm. per child, and an awful lot of what we are spending in the classroom goes to PERS. So, uh, or an awful lot mm-hmm. of what we are spending goes to PERS. And so, although in the past I've always said don't increase the school budget, I now believe that we should have, and we did increase the school budget but not as much as my party wanted to increase it. Uh, But fundamentally, we are not going to do better under the the governor's plan, and we are not going to do better until the PERS problem is solved. So what should we do? Well, it's stunning to me. Uh, Charter schools operate on 50% of uh, the money that public that the regular district schools get it's officially 80 percent of the state money but um, uh, they get lots of other monies other than the regular state allotment and so it's they about half taxes. yeah um, in the Arthur Academy we were educating kids for less than five thousand dollars per per kid compared and to Oregon to compare, yeah. Twelve thousand. Well, you know, you can't get a straight answer. You're here seven. You're here nine. You're here twelve. Um, everybody, you know, you, you can't even Portland can't t- tell you how much they spend per kid, but it's a lot more. And doing as good a job, or in the case of the schools that I was working with, the Arthur Academy is better than the surrounding districts they're in. So, if we would like to save some money, 
we should have more charter schools. Absolutely. But we don't. We, we don't do that. The reason you can do it for less is that there's not so much bureaucracy. There's a huge amount of bureaucracy. And, and over the last 30 years, it's multiplied like seven or eight times the amount of administrative overhead and out of classroom things compared to... Algebra won't be done until the ninth grade. And what we're seeing is under No Child Left Behind is that what was done and called algebra had nothing to do with algebra because no, co uh, you know, 10% of the kids were ready for algebra. Mm -hmm. And you can go into the mm -hmm. reading. I just get very emotional on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, again, standards are uh, well and good. And we can argue there's a lot of controversy mm -hmm. about the, the set of standards. But really, if you want to make something better, you have to start from the ground up. You have to say, what can we do in first grade? What, what, what can we accomplish that's reasonable, that we can do, and, and set a standard for that? And then once you achieve that, then you can maybe do the next one. But you have to do it in your school with your teachers and do, somebody can't from up here say, you're gonna hit that mark. Here's the thing, NCLB, the No Child Left Behind, was supposed to this year everybody was supposed to be a hundred percent proficient <laughs> you know that was the goal there it was going to ever no one would be left behind right, everyone right, right. well awesome. we didn't get there yeah. um a b we changed the rules which i said we were going to do you know as soon as we started as soon as the you know it gets bad they'll change it because they don't want to look bad uh but you know it's it's we we couldn't do it with those standards and so now we're going to try to make more rigorous ones hmm. Well, well if you can't do it, you can't do it. It Don, doesn't matter what standards are. Don, in, in something he has written, looks very closely at the reading standards. So, um, look, in like the third grade, I know that there are like 72 different standards. Your report card is now going to be 72 <laughs> things long. The teacher has to grade all of these things, send it home. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's crazy. It's, it's a five page report <laughs> card. But one of the standards every one of the standards on reading is the child is supposed to understand what the, you know and they have to be able to answer questions none of the so uh, so they give you a, a a puzzle you know this a little reading problem and then you're supposed to answer the questions and if you can answer the questions right then you've passed the reading but as don pointed out if you don't answer the questions right, there's no way of knowing whether you didn't understand or you couldn't read. Whereas it would be very easy to test them on reading directly. There is nothing in the standards which actually looks at whether that child is reading. The University of Oregon, they created a thing called Dibbles that's used all over the country. And they have kids read aloud from passages and they count to see how many words they can read in a minute and how accurately they read. And they have standards for, you know, uh, fall, winter, and spring for first mm -hmm. grade and second mm -hmm. grade and kindergarten. And they can do that. Those are actual measurable things that kids can do. Nothing like that is in the, the common, common core. core. It's what, all about critical thinking. All about critical thinking. And, and here's what happens. You give a passage to a kid, and you ask some tricky questions that, you know, he's a nice kid, but he doesn't, you know, you can fool him pretty easy. <laughs> you know kids like that. I used to see that in Baltimore. I would, I would sit in a, in a classroom where kids have been taught exactly the same material, it were the same level of skill, and then they would take the test and sitting right next to each other, this kid would get it right and the kid next to him would get it wrong. Because hmm. it's not quite just that bright. Mm -hmm. Well, they were using the fact that he didn't get it right to measure the school, which doesn't make any sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's not a skill that you, it's just how smart is he? Can he make those inferences? Can he, can he get a joke? Can he do? And so those things are mixed into these standards and these tests in a way that means that you you can't do this. We can improve education, mind you, but you again, you have to do it from the ground up. You have to do it, you know, one school at a time. I've been thinking about... And you have to teach them to read. Right. You have to you teach absolutely them teach those fundamental skills. Yeah. Yeah, because what kids are learning, what we are all learning in this PC world, mm -hmm. is to pass the test. You yeah. look at the multiple choice, and I know you say, 
what would a really stupid people want person who was very PC want me to say here? <laughs> mm -hmm. So what this, the student is doing is trying to not get up the right answer, even the answer the student thinks is correct, but the student, the, the answer that the student thinks the teacher wants. Right, 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 right. With the well, smartphone, right? Well, well, yeah. I've, got, I've got to take, fun, excuse me, but I've got to take five minutes to mm -hmm. spend a little time on Bokehead, you know, bring, mm -hmm. it, bring it home here in Oregon. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, what comes to mind right off the bat is the Intel situation, the announcement they're going to build, uh, build maybe twice, the, the, double the size of Intel, i.e. electronics, high tech and whatever. But I can see a number of Vokehead stuff that's sitting up in there. And yet the announcement was we're going to have to go outside of Oregon, outside of this country, to find people to come over here and, and be employed. What's wrong with that picture? There's something wrong with that picture. Don, I want to take advantage of that with you. Mm -hmm. Vokehead. Talk about Vokehead for a bit. Well, it's we, two, two parts to that. Um, in Intel's jobs, are, a lot of them are high yeah. high engineering, yeah. high math kind of stuff, way beyond my capability. Uh, and I know that um, there are kids who are smart enough to do that. Our problem is that by having monopoly schools where everybody has to do the exact same thing, we aren't letting those kids soar ahead and, and learn as fast as they can and really get to loving math and engineering and be ready mm -hmm. for high challenging college stuff so they could do these kinds how of should, jobs. How should they do that then? How well you just that? have to let kids go. You have to have classes where not everybody can get into this class. Mm -hmm. Not everybody does that. I, when I was a big brother I had a kid who who won awards at the math Olympiad thing, right? He was way advanced and when he went from fifth grade to sixth grade in the junior high they would not let him take advanced math. Hmm. He had to take the same math that every other sixth grader could and he was like three years beyond that. And it's just we have this system that's rigid and set and won't do things and doesn't let the, and has all these rules about oh we don't want to have special classes we don't mm. want to have and so that's why we need we need choice in schools we need schools of kids who love math and just zoom ahead and and get some teachers in there that really know high level stuff and some people from intel uh, if so that's one part of it if you're talking vocational yeah, training okay. yeah that's, okay, that's if you're education. talking vocational training I know kids who dropped out of high school. Or, I mean, they dropped out in the ninth grade, and I thought they'll never go to college. But they did. Actually, they did wonderful on their SATs after not going to high school for four years because they wanted to fly airplanes. Now, in order to fly airplanes, or let's say work heavy equipment, or one of these kids was wanted to weld. I mean, he just liked to make swords. Um, in, in order to do that, to fly the airplanes, that kid had to, by hook or by crook, learn an awful lot of mathematics. And read. Mm -hmm. And read and get his license. Now, it's true that all he learned was mathematics and reading, and he ended up going to a college in Indiana, a very prominent one, and got a degree in flying and aeronautical <laughs> engineering. But he did it without any high school because when you want to do something, and his cousin the welder got the associate's degree, when you want to do something, you will learn what is necessary to do it. We have jobs that are, are, people are going out of Oregon to fill, construction jobs in Oregon, that are paying seventy or eighty thousand dollars a year. They don't require college degrees, but they require enough training to use high-tech equipment to be able to do those jobs. So vocational training is not a dead end. It's not for dummies. It's for people who want to do things with their hands and build things. And we don't have that. Yeah, we, there, we about, don't we have got, enough. We, we got about three minutes, yep. and let's spend the time now to talk to that Blue Ribbon Committee and the governor. I mean, in all due respect, he, he, he probably wants to do the right thing, you know, and the bottom line is that I'm going to take advantage of the two of you to say, hey, now you're speaking to the governor. Tell him what he needs to do. Okay. Same, same thing Moses said. Okay. Let my people go. Oh. 
<laughs> let, <laughs> let there be charter schools. Let the state spend all their time buying up these schools that are closing up right. and rent them out to mm -hmm. charter schools. And it's still and public schools. They're still public schools. It's still public money. They're going to save money. They're going to have more variety. Get s talk to every superintendent. A charter school is like a subcontractor. Mm -hmm. You're a general contractor and you don't like to do plumbing, get a subcontractor and he can do it cheaper than you can and, um, and the job gets done, you put the rest of the money in your pocket. Superintendents should feel about charter schools like contractors feel about subcontractors. Teachers and kids, the classroom, the yes, teachers are going to be employed. They're going to be employed, they're going to do that, but they're going to be free to do things a little bit differently and figure out how to keep those high school kids, how to how to get vocational things that make them interested and stay in school and get jobs. That's what they want. Look, they want jobs. There's no trick to being an excellent high school if you're in Lake Oswego because you've got the money. You've got a lot of property taxes and you've got a lot of charity money. Mm -hmm. But the best district in the state is consistently Corbett mm -hmm. that doesn't have the money. But what they had was an extremely gutsy superintendent of schools who simply refused to play by that game. If you look at the U.S. News World Report, Corbett is the best high school in the state and has been for ages. Wow. And they've done Corbett charter schools, they've done uh, all the kinds of things Don is talking about, uh, and they have the same percentages of poor, they have the same percentages of minorities as any of the what other districts. What about the districts. administration aspect of it, that piece at the school? They have, they took, they grabbed in the face of an extremely powerful state government, that man grabbed independence. Mm -hmm. he, he, he said, I am not going to do it your way and my county is going to support me hmm. and he and he did the right thing we need more Corbett's yeah more independence more freedom wow. more choice in school well hey on that particular note I tell you what I will appreciate the fact that you've been here both of you and thank again for you choose <laughs> and I, I'd like to make the announcement the fact I think our next episode for you choose will be talking in regards to a stand your ground at Trevon Trevon Martin thing we're gonna try to see make some sense of that and we're going to have, we're going to probably put a, quite a panel, if you will, to discuss this yes. issue. Next month, you choose, and, and Bruce Broussard are going to uh, take on the controversies and the issues of the Trayvon Martin, um, George Zimmerman case. Right, right, right. And I think we'll do it with a panel. It, we're in early uh, stages, but I've... And also, the case keeps changing. I mean, yeah. what is well, current? Yes. That's why we need that much. It just keeps changing. <laughs> yeah. We need that much. But I think that that we can bring to it something which other news organizations in Oregon okay. don't bring to it. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Don. Thank Appreciate you. it very much, yeah. folks. Thank you very much. And for your friends and folks out there, let them know about the program. You can get us all it's on YouTube, and you know about the repeat on Tuesdays and Fridays. Take care. Have a good day, and stay cool.